All right, so welcome. Um, we're going to go over the last unit for NUR 265, which would be unit 11. And unit 11, as you see here, covers chapters 10, 11, and 12. So if you look at your syllabus, that's what we're going over. This week is all about emergency care, disaster preparedness, the bioterrorism stuff, emergencies, the ED, level one trauma center, stuff like that. We're going to go over the cold and hot injuries. Just a few of the things that don't really fit in anywhere else. <clears throat> Not that you're going to be an ER nurse when you graduate, but a lot of the same things apply to the patients regardless of the situation. So we're going to go here and, and just go over a few things. I want to start like I always start. The priority is going to be safety, communication, and teamwork. Safety is the biggest one, though. When we think about safety in an emergency room, it's not always just about patient safety at this point. It's about public safety. It's about the safety of all the staff. It's about the, the safety of everybody inside the hospital. If we really think about what the emergency room is, it, it is the front door for every hospital. Most people get admitted through the emergency department. Even if you have a doctor calling in, that's pretty much what happens. So that's what we're going to kind of get into. If you've never worked in an emergency room, it is fascinating. It's my only place I've ever worked. I love emergency medicine and trauma. I don't really care about the rest of medicine at all. That's just me though. I like things you can do, you can fix, you can treat, very acute things. So just wanna kind of think about that. In the emergency room though, you get every client from every walk of life. It doesn't matter where you come from, what you do. If you have money, no money, it doesn't matter if you're um, a psych patient or an OBGYN patient, it does not matter. Everybody seeks care there, and it can range from newborn babies to end-of-life care and everything in between. So the ER presents with a, with a lot of different um, nuances you might not see other places. We know that homelessness is a really big thing. And when we start thinking about the emergency room and the emergency department, I think about the emergency room as being the primary health care, the primary health care provider for everybody in this country without insurance. If you think we don't pay for insurance in this country for everybody, you'd be sadly mistaken because every single patient, regardless of your ability to pay, can come into the emergency room and get checked out. So that's what we do. It's just not cost effective. So as we start thinking about the people in the ER and your job as a nurse, Everything's got to be patient-centered care. And that means that you have to have empathy for every patient. You have to have equitability for every patient. So as we're thinking about this, homelessness is a huge problem um, in this country to begin with. And this is a very vulnerable population. And we see that increasingly numbers of young folks, single parents, and then anybody in the LGBTQT um, arena typically fall underneath this. Uh, they have more likelihood and more susceptibility to homelessness because of the way this country and, and the moral high ground certain places kind of impact that. So <clears throat> something I want you to think about, patient-centered care is about what the patient wants. Quality patient care, quality is determined by the patient. So nobody, and I say this with all due respect and love, nobody cares about your opinion about anybody else. We just don't. I sure as hell don't care about anybody's opinion about somebody else. What I care about is the patient standing in front of me and if I can treat them or not. So as we start seeing here, if a patient comes to you and they're transitioning, if you have a transgender woman and she tells you she wants to be called a woman, then you say, yes, ma'am, and you know, that kind of stuff. Your opinion doesn't matter if you want to be an effective nurse because effective nurses provide patient-centered care that is holistic and it revolves around the patient's wants, needs, and desires. So I'm gonna put that out there just like that. That's how we do nursing. Um, the emergency room is also a place where a lot of folks come when they have nowhere else to go. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, when the weather is bad, our ERs are always full. They just are. When there's great weather, people don't show up. When it's cold and wet, we have a lot more influx of patients who are sick, but they're homeless. They need food, they need medicine. They don't have any other recourse. So that's where I'm trying to get you to understand the, 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 the population you're gonna have there. Um, one of the biggest things you're going to do as a nurse, especially when you think about emergency medicine, is promoting trust. 
that's what I mean by that patient-centered care. Your patient's not going to do anything with you unless they trust you, unless you give them this, this respect they deserve. That's what it says here. You have to make eye contact, speak calmly, avoid you being prejudiced. Don't prejudge anybody. Your stereotypical remarks, whatever it is you thought was right as a kid growing up or whatever society told you you're supposed to think about people, that's got to go out the window. So we have to listen. We have to be the person who's going to be there for them to provide a very safe space. All right. Um, it's imperative for so many reasons. So the patient gets healed, but also so you can build rapport with a patient who might be psychotic, who might have nothing else to live for. Nurses must always maintain situational awareness. If you're ever in an emergency room, there are people who are going to come in there and try to hurt you. So we have to be worried about the patient's safety, the safety of all the patients around us, as well as our personal safety in the staff. Um, that's something we have to do. Your book says so, even ATI, they talk about needing to anticipate for potential violent behavior. You have to look for anybody who poses a safety risk to everybody in the ER. I remember this when I was in Memphis, Tennessee, level one trauma center. I'm stationed there in the Navy. I had a part-time job. But we had police. You had to come, you had to go through an armed police entrance to get into the ER because we had gang violence there. And if there was a gang shooting, we've had shootouts in the emergency room in the trauma center. So yeah, potential for violent behaviors. That is a huge safety concern for people in the emergency room. So make sure you're able to identify that before it escalates and kind of goes into anything else. I had a psych patient one time. He chased my security guard through the hallway naked. He was butt naked, chasing my security guard because he thought he was a vampire and he was supposed to bite him on the neck. Y'all, patient safety. You have to be aware of people who are in a traumatic. These are ER patients. They ain't right sometimes. So be aware of where you have to think safety-wise. Go back to the top here. It says safety is a priority. I just talked about three or four things right now that are very much safety related. Standard precautions. You all know what standard precautions are. When they come into the ER, you're the first person to hear anything. So if they come in and they start talking about um, anything that makes you feel like, oh my gosh, that dude might have tuberculosis. We might want to put them on airborne precautions. How about the patient over here who walks in and, and, and they live in the, the military barracks, if you're in San Antonio, or if you're in a college town, they live in the dorms. And they come in with light sensitivity and they have, they have nuchal rigidity. That is somebody I'd be worried about having meningitis. So when you start thinking about these people, it's no longer, oh, we'll take care of it later. No, you got to take care of it right now because every patient in the ER potentially could get admitted. And if we give everybody TB, we're going to have a TB outbreak. So, or if we have meningitis, it could be a viral meningitis outbreak. Just things that we have to be aware of and very cognizant of that not everybody else has to think about from the get-go. All right. I'm not going to get into the different types of nurses in the ER because they're very much um, specific. If one of your teachers told you during class that we needed to talk about forensic nurse examiners or psychiatric crisis nurse teams, please let me know. But we're still talking about teamwork, collaboration, and safety. We're trying to figure out the best way uh, to figure out how to keep people safe. That's really all we're going to talk about there. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time debating any of that. We won't really get into EMTs or paramedics because I think you know what those are. But we do work as a team. And a lot of what we understand in, in, in medicine, especially when we think emergency medicine or, or go back to trauma, and we'll talk about trauma shortly, but trauma originated from war. We didn't have a lot of traumas until we started driving fast and things like that. So we, we know that trauma, we also have to have emergency medical techs. We have to have paramedics who can do stuff in the field and stabilize you and bring you in. That is military medicine 101. So go back and, you know, and look at this key points. It really is fascinating how they all tie in together. I just don't think we need to waste a lot of time on that in order for you to do well in this class and to graduate and pass the NCLEX. So we're going to move on from that. Um, just know that everybody who comes into the ER, if they're sick enough, they're going, to be, they're going to be admitted to the hospital. So they're going to go somewhere else. So we have to think about what that looks like. Handoff communication, patient safety, Thinking about transmission-based precautions. Do they need to be on, you know, neutropenic type precautions, reverse isolation, whatever that looks like? Are, are they psychotic? Do they need to have a one-on-one -on -one sitter? Um, are they are they violent? There's a lot of stuff that we get to decide in the ER that nobody else thinks about. So there you go. That's the first part I wanted to kind of hit. The second part, still going on the staff and patient safety considerations. If you look in this QSIM box, it tells you a lot of the stuff I just talked about. 
let's prevent falls. Let's keep stretchers low. Let's keep, you know, handrails up. You know what you're supposed to do. Keep the call light in place. Nothing that we need to get too crazy about. But down here, injury prevention for staff. Standard precautions across the board. If somebody comes in and they look like they, they might have something, if they give you any indication that they were out of the country, they traveled, they were exposed to something, we have the responsibility to enter or to, to enact those standard precautions and then any kind of specific transmission precautions. We have to anticipate hostile, violent patients, their families, visitors. You have to be aware if somebody just got raped, if somebody got beat up, if this was a road rage incident, that should be a very good indicator that somebody might be mad and trying to get in there to kill this person. Like it or not, we do have people who come into the ER trying to kill other people. So it is imperative that we prevent injuries to the staff and, and, and the other patients around there. Plan for violence occurrences. Understand how to get assistance. Understand how to get out of the hospital if you need to be out of there quicker. All right. <clears throat> um, I talked about a lot of this potential for transmission of disease and or personal safety when working with patients. These are the two big things that we're going to focus on when it talks about safety. Now, down here again, it still talks about hostile environments. It mentions it so many times in your book because it's that important. People do get beat up all the time. Nurses do get violently attacked in places like the emergency room. I love it, y'all. It's my favorite place to work. If it wasn't chaotic, I'd probably never work again. So it is okay to like that kind of stuff, but you really have to be aware of what's going on. There are gangs, domestic abuse. They, like I said, you name it, I've seen it. I love it. But I'm also six foot three and, you know, pretty decent sized fella. So I don't get beat up a whole lot. But when that dude started chasing my security guard naked, he was way bigger than me. He reminded me of Debo off of Friday. Anyway, we'll keep moving on. All right. So patient safety, once again, um, make sure that we're identifying the right patients. If you've never been in an emergency room, not everybody's in a bed in, in, in a room where you can put a chart. A lot of folks are going to be on gurneys in the hallway. We're going to have people sitting in chairs. We will treat people anywhere we can treat them. If you're not dying, I'll make you sit in a chair in the back of the ER and do an IV in your arm. Sometimes it's all you get, or we'll just line up beds along the hallway, and I'll have eight patients in the ER, four in rooms and four in beds along the hallway. It can be chaotic. So patient identification, you, you, you think it, go back and think about your national patient safety goals, the 2020 national patient safety goals, where we say we have the, the, the patient's name, date of birth, their, their, their agency identifier, whatever it is. We have to ensure that we are the safety people. Fall precautions, put on the yellow bracelet. Do the things you know you need to do because this is what we're going to test you over. When a patient falls or somebody gets stabbed, that's what we care about. You're not ever going to treat diseases. It's not the nurse's job. You will never treat a medical disease so long as you're a nurse, ever. You can participate in the treatment of that the doctor prescribes for it, but nurses have their own scope of practice. We do something very different than doctors. We work collaboratively together to do stuff. So fall risk, things like that. That's for us to decide. We don't need anybody to tell us how to do that. Do your job so we can prevent injuries. All right, there's a lot of different scopes of practice that I'm not going to really get into. But what you really have to think about is assessment nonstop. The foundation of emergency nursing is assessment, recognizing cues, analyzing cues, prioritizing, general select. Like you have to be able to problem solve. You can't problem solve unless you have a really good assessment. And if you don't know what you're assessing, if you don't understand how the body works, if you don't know why a patient with this disease process would present that way, then you're probably not going to be really good at your job. And I say that with all due love and respect. It is okay to graduate nursing school and realize you have a knowledge deficit that you need to work against for the next two or three years as you become a better nurse. So assessments, if you don't know what you're looking for on every patient based on what they're presenting for, their mechanism of injury, their diagnosis, then you have work to do still, and that is okay. You won't be an ER nurse when you graduate more than likely. You'll probably be somewhere else. So make sure you think about assessment and the importance because the importance of assessment carries through in 265. It goes to 283. It's going to be on your ATI and your NCLEX, and it's never going to go away. So make sure you know the history. Make sure you're understanding the importance of conditions, things like that. And so I'm just going to keep going through this, and at the end, we can talk about whatever you want to. I'm not going to waste time on things that I know don't show up anywhere else. Now, if your teacher tells you differently, listen to your teacher. You already had this lecture. I'm giving you enrichment. All right. Um, 
<clears throat> well, I'm not going to get into training and stuff, but I do want to get down here to triage because triage is a really big part uh, of what we do in emergency nursing. We always have to triage somebody in the emergency room on a regular, uh, you know, Friday night. We are going to assess people and a person with a lower acuity problem will wait longer than somebody who's going to die faster. That's all we're saying acuity. If you have a high acuity patient, they're always going to be at the head of the line. We call that a life-threatening emergent patient. So if you think about the triage system we use in the U.S., it is three-tiered, emergent, urgent, and non-urgent. Emergent means you're going to die without some help right away. It's life-threatening. You have chest pain. You're diaphoretic. That's a sign and symptom of a mild cardio infarction, right? It just is. You're hemorrhaging, like excessively. Now your blood pressure is 90 over 60. Your respiratory rate is 40, and your heart rate is, uh, you know, 38. Those are all signs and symptoms that you're in hypovolemic shock. Those are patients who are going to die unless we do something with them, right? So that's something we can always think about. Um, stroke. Vital sign, vital sign instability. This is my favorite because this is every NCLEX question I've ever got. Which patient do you see first? And they show somebody who has a vital signs of 120 over 80 and the pulse is normal and the respirations are normal. And then the vital signs are no longer stable. What do non-stable vital signs look like? If you're not perfusing, a blood pressure systolically less than 90 is always problematic. You will not perfuse the brain like you should. I'll show you in the book where it talks about that. A heart rate that is too slow. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. If you have a heart rate less than what's desired in the 40s and 30s, your patient will die at some point sooner than later. So don't be all looking for huge answers. Look for things that make sense. If the vital signs are off and they're not perfusing, that is a patient who is life-threatening. They're emergent. Just because you have a broken leg doesn't mean you're going to die. If it's a simple fracture, that's non-urgent. I will make you sit in my ER for four or five, six hours in the waiting room if I have people who are really dying. I don't care that your kid's arm's broke. I'm sorry, but they're not going to die from it. It's a simple fracture. They're going to be all right. That's hard for parents to understand. I have five kids. Trust me. Not all fractures are the same. If you have a displaced fracture, it's open. It's sticking out. It's, it, it's com uh, um, uh, um, a comminuted fracture. You have multiple breaks. Yeah, those are things we worry about. If you don't have good pulses, if you have bounding pulses on one and weak and thready on the other, I like to say life over limb. So when I think about urgent, it's, it's not immediate. You're not going to die right away, but you could die sooner than later, or you can lose your, your, your limb at some point. Non-urgent, simple fractures, rashes, strains. You got a UTI that's uncomplicated. I get it. Make sure you can identify on an exam those kind of things because they always pop up based on who do you triage. There are going to be triage questions on your exam. You and I both know this. It's okay. Just go back and think about emergent as being the ones who are going to die or lose something, a limb, uh, eyesight. <clears throat> they're they're going to they're gonna have lose brain matter, stroke, life or limb. When we say limb, we don't literally mean your arm's going to fall off, but if you lose your ability to control your arms, you've lost your limb. Your ADLs are down. That's what we're looking at. Non-urgent, basic, run-in-the-mill stuff that's not going to kill you. You can wait days and not die from it. It's going to be all right. All right. So, like I said, you can keep going down. There's a lot it talks about. I'm, I'm not going to cover things that just aren't that important. Um, if your teacher did, go back and listen to what they said, and you'll be fine. Case management. We, we do talk about case management, but we don't hit it heavy. There's no need to right now. In the emergency room, case managers are going to do certain things, but they're usually made for people being discharged. So, I'm going to kind of move through that also. If you have questions about case management, please go back there and look more. All right, death and dying. So death in the emergency department. I, I always joke, and it's a horrible joke because, you know, we got bad, we got bad senses of humor as emergency nurses. But I always say, I don't care where you die. You just can't die here. And I say that with all due love and respect. I can't control if you live or die. Sometimes it's out of your hands. So when you come into the emergency room, though, you typically don't die in the emergency room. We will stabilize you, send you to the ICU, and you'll die in the ICU. Um, or we'll send you to surgery, and in the surgery, they'll do something. If it doesn't do well, they'll stabilize you, send you to the ICU, you'll die in the ICU. That's just a real truth. So when we think about the emergency department, what I typically have is somebody comes in dead, and they don't ever leave, right? But that happens all the time. So we will have patients in the emergency room who do not make it. Emergency department staff have to know how to address families, 
They have to know how to address the body afterward. So these are things that you have to be aware of. A lot of times in the hospital, we'll do resuscitation and, and patients may or may not be there. But in the emergency room, there's always patients. When my mother died, um, I, I, I went and saw her. I knew she was going to die for years. But anyway, she ended up having a heart attack. They took her to the ER. I got there. They diverted her to another hospital. I get there and they're like, we're, we're, they're working on her. I'm like, I know, I want to go back in there and see my mother. And they wouldn't let me. So I called the house supervisor and I threw a fit because I'm, I'm a care and I don't care, y'all. I'm going to advocate for what I care about. And if nobody else likes it, I don't care. <laughs> Just don't anymore. So I got back there and saw my mother. And that's, that's one of those things. It is okay. Sometimes as a house supervisor, I absolutely let the family come in and watch. Always. So family present during resuscitation has really been something that we do more. Families like to watch you work on their family. They like to see that you've done so much to save their family member. It gives them a lot of peace when they watch and they can tell the family, listen, I watched them do compressions for 40 minutes. I watched them do this. I watched them pay, blah, blah, blah. So it is okay to do that. But you as a staff member, you have to determine if it's appropriate or not for the family to stay. Right. Just be, if they're if they're throwing a fit and they're crying and screaming and they're making it where the family can't, you know, where you can't work as a team, it's OK to remove them. But just be aware there's no one size fits all. When your patient does die or if the patient dies before a family gets there or, if they, you know, they, they came in dead and we have to pronounce them dead. It's OK. It just depends on what's going on. So there may be a requirement for, for the forensics to come in and investigate first. So if we're thinking about somebody who was shot out in town, if we're thinking about somebody who was in a, I don't know, a police involved with something, or they, they, they fell off a building, or I don't know, fill in the blanks. Certain times we'll have people um, who have IV lines, they have catheters, they have chest tubes, and it's okay. We're not worried about it. But ED staff may not be able to remove certain things if we're afraid that it could potentially damage evidence, if the patient dies from something, a trauma, trauma deaths, homicides, um, things like that, those are the ones that we have to wait and let somebody else look for. So you're never going to pull the, the, the tubes out of them or take the lines off. Somebody else needs to do an autopsy first to make sure that the patient died from what we say they died from. And it wasn't us that did something, you know, that perpetuated their death, hastened their death or caused them to die. So what do you do when you have a patient in the ER who's going to die or is dead? Cover the body with a sheet or a blanket. Leave the patient's face exposed. Dim the lights before the family comes in. Try to make it a more hospitable place where they don't see their family member laid out on the bed with tubes coming out of them. Uh, I see that with ATI and NCLEX all the time. So make sure you understand postmortem care on some level because it is going to be your responsibility at some point in your career. All right. So trauma nursing, I want you to understand what trauma nursing is. Bodily injury. When somebody gets injured, that is a trauma. It could be a mild trauma. It could be a severe trauma. If you get stabbed with a needle in your finger, that's a trauma. If you get shot in the face with a gun, that's a trauma. They're totally different ends of the spectrum, but they're still traumatic. So any kind of traumatic assault to the body. It could be assault, homicide, it could be suicide, it could be unintentional, like an accident, it could be an act of terrorism. It doesn't matter if somebody gets hurt, they have a trauma to their body, that's what we're talking about. So it can come from all kinds of stuff, sports injuries, it could be spousal related, it could be a, 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 um, it could be a sexual assault. There are so many things that we have to deal with. So I'm just trying to prepare you for what the, what the role looks like. Not everybody who has a trauma goes to a trauma center, though, right? If you've never been to a trauma center, if you're in San Antonio, um, we have a trauma center. We have two of them. We have University Hospital right in the medical center. You can see it from Galen College of Nursing. It is a level one trauma center. And in level one trauma centers, they do a lot of stuff. They literally do everything. It's usually attached to a university or something where you have all of these people. And what they do, these centers have the responsibility to do all kinds of stuff, professional, community education, conducting research. Um, they participate in, 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 in city planning. These are the hospitals that are always going to be involved in everything. They're usually large teaching hospitals. So if you ever want to know where the level one trauma center is, it's probably associated with the college somewhere because they need enough residents and interns in there to learn how to do their job. So not everybody who goes who gets trauma goes to a level one trauma center. 
they can go to ERs and stuff. A level one trauma center, if you look at the difference here, they typically have the patients who are going to die if they don't go somewhere else. So people get transferred here from other places once they're stabilized. I'm not going to get into all of this. If anybody has something specific they want to ask afterwards, please come back and let me know. But when we think about trauma systems, that's all it is, a coordinated effort between 911, um, be between uh, disaster preparedness. It really is just something that's going to let us know where people need to go. If you're out in the middle of the country somewhere, I think I keep going back to Tennessee when I was out there in Memphis. You had Arkansas, Tennessee, Louisiana, Mississippi, Kentucky, Missouri. I mean, you had all these places right there who had no level one trauma centers anywhere close. So a lot of people who had four wheel accidents, they had hunting accidents. We got so many people life flighted in. It is where everybody comes. All right. When you know that people are coming, you don't always know what, what they're diagnosed with because you have no clue. So in the ER and in, in places like a trauma center, we use something called mechanism of injury. Y'all, that's no different than a chief complaint. If a patient says, oh, I'm having chest pain that radiates to my left arm and they're diaphoretic, it's probably having a heart attack. If a patient says, oh, I, I got shot in the stomach, well, they got shot in the stomach. Like, you know what it is. These mechanism of injuries are going to key you in on certain details that help you start looking for traumatic events. If you're in a high-speed motor vehicle crash, if you fell from something three times higher than you, if you got shot in the stomach, these details are gonna let us know the severity, the acuity, probably what the patient outcome will be. So these are things that we really have to think about and communicate when you think pre-hospital, if the EMT is not communicating correctly, we don't have time to get our trauma room together. We don't have time to get x-ray down and surgery on call. That's why we, we orchestrate this. This is really like a ballet. It's such a beautiful effort when you start thinking about emergency medicine. I highly recommend it to anybody who gets bored. So um, going down those same lines, when we think about mechanism of injuries, we're gonna think about two of the most common injury producing mechanisms and it's blunt force trauma and it's penetrating trauma. So when I think about blunt trauma, I could get in a wreck where I hit somebody from the rear end. There's no real trauma, but if my chest hits the steering wheel, so if the mechanism of injury is a crash at 40 miles an hour, one of the questions I'm gonna ask the, the EMT is, was there a bent steering wheel? Was there airbag deployment? I'm gonna look at the patient's chest. I'm gonna get them trauma naked. We'll talk about that in a minute. Everybody who comes into my trauma center is going to get butt naked. I'm going to cut all your clothes off because I need to look at your body and see if I see anything that lets me know you might have an underlying injury. So we think about that. We think about people who have motor vehicle crashes. They fall, assaults. Even if you get beat up with something, you get hit by the baseball bat in the chest or a baseball, any of those things. So we have to look for signs and symptoms of trauma, trauma to bones, blood vessels, soft tissue injuries. We're looking for swelling. We're looking for bleeding. We're looking for ecchymosis and bruising. That's what we're looking for. The most subtle changes in things like your integumentary system can, 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 can clue us in that your patient has a blood force trauma that might have caused underlying tissue damage and ultimately organ problems. That's what we're worried about. You're going to die from those. Penetrating traumas, they're usually pretty obvious. If somebody walks in and they have a knife sticking out of their head, you pretty much can imagine their brain got involved. Or if, once again, they got a bow and arrow and they got shot through their, their chest. My case, I shot my best friend in the leg with a 22 when we were like 14 and 16. He had blood coming out of his leg for hours. Like we were trying to, you know, duct tape his leg shut so he wouldn't bleed to death. That didn't work. I'm just saying, there are certain things, penetrating traumas that you can kind of see. Fragments, grenades, explosions. People have these home bombs. Y'all know the country we live in. 19 children just got murdered in Uvalde, Texas which is horrible, penetrating wounds. It happens daily, it happens. So you have to be aware of this and you have to understand where your role is because you never know when disaster drills are gonna strike and the ER is gonna be too full and you have to come down and help. I'm just being real. I know it's sad, but this is the world we live in. All right, when you think about emergency medicine, one of the ways it changes from other places is you always have to think, is the scene safe? So when you're thinking about unit exams, ATI, NCLEX, things like that, if you're looking in the emergency department, think about scene safety. You never, think about EMT people who are out there on, on the scene. If they pull up to a domestic abuse, they're not gonna walk into the house and try to save anybody. They're gonna wait for the cops to show up. 
because a dead rescuer rescues nobody. Same thing in the ER. If somebody comes in and they've been exposed to a chemical or something like that, if I just rush over and start trying to help them and we don't decontaminate the patient first, it's likely I too could die. And if everybody in the hospital dies, we can't take care of patients. So scene safety is huge. This goes underneath our primary and resuscitative interventions. So when we think about trauma, we do a primary survey. And a primary survey is always going to be A, B, C, D, E. Y'all know airway, breathing, circulation. Cool. We're going to talk about that. Primary survey is looking for anything that can make you die right now, immediately death. If you don't have an airway, you will be dead soon. If you are not breathing, getting gas exchange where you can take air from the outside world, put it into your alveolar spaces and get gas exchange, you are not breathing, you will die. Think about somebody with carbon monoxide poisoning. They have an airway, they can't breathe because their, their hemoglobin is saturated with carbon monoxide and the oxygen can't get in there, they will die. Circulation, that doesn't mean their heart's not beating. If they're not getting good circulation somewhere because they're hypovolemic, because they're in cardiogenic shock, because they're septic, that is still a circulatory problem. It doesn't have to do anything with bleeding out. We are looking at the ability to perfuse through circulation. So you have to think differently. If you, I find nursing school easy because I'm an, I'm a, I'm a, I was a paramedic first and I'm an ER trauma nurse. Everything is about airway, breathing, and circulation. I personally never cared about anything more than that. I still don't to date. I'm not going to take care of a patient long term. Not my job. I'm going to do things that I need to do. And that's what everything NCLEX requires is for you to look at airway, breathing, circu circulation. Go a step further. Disability. I'm not saying you're disabled. We're saying cognition. We're going to talk about that and then exposure. One other caveat is when we say airway, it's always airway with cervical spine. Because if somebody has a high cervical spine injury and you don't do something to maintain cervical spine integrity, they will no longer have an airway and they'll die. So airway, cervical spine, right? Think about head, tilt, chin lift versus jaw thrust, then breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Let me show you what that looks like. Circulation, y'all. I'm going to go back here and say it again. Circulation is not just about bleeding. It's not. Presence of radial pulses. I want you to look at this in a second. These are talking about blood pressures. So when we talk about circulation, I'm just talking about your ability right here. The adequacy of your heart rate, your blood pressure, and the overall perfusion, that's your assessment. So you have to think about perfusion. It could be a blood clot. It could be a PE. That's a circulatory problem. It could be some kind of a, a mangled leg, where, or it could be a broken femur that now has shortened and externally rotated and included the arter arterial blood flow circulation. That's what we're trying to get you to think about. All right. I told you earlier, hypotension. Hypotension will kill you. Hypotension is very much a sign and a symptom of shock, right? If you are hypotensive and you are tachycardic and tachypnic, those are the hallmark signs of hypovolemic shock. So just be aware of that. I love this right here. If you can feel a carotid pulse, uh, carotid, femoral, radial, know where they're at. You can start saying, if I have a radial pulse, I have a blood pressure of at least 80. Because if you don't have enough pressure to check the radial pulse, you'll never feel it. Femoral, at least 70. If I check at your neck, you have a BP of 60. People don't live very long with a BP of 60. People don't live very long with a BP of 70. They don't live very long with a BP of 80. Let's just be honest. So it's important for you to understand stuff like that. Um, I was going to say something there. I forgot what I was going to say. We'll figure it out in a minute. It'll come to me in a little while. I do like talking about hypotension, though, and, and just your body's ability to maintain stuff. When you get to hypotension, it's too late, right? Hypotension, contemporary mechanisms used by the body in the temp have been exhausted. So when you have a patient that is severely hypotensive, their body's already given out. They're probably not going to last much longer unless you do something for them. All right, so airway, breathing, circulation, we understand that. Disability, we have something called AFPU and something called the GCS, your Glasgow Coma Scale. AFPU is something you look at somebody, you look at them, are they alert? If somebody's looking around like this and they're like, hey nurse, what's going on? They're alert. You can imagine their neurological status is okay. If they're not alert and I'm like, sir, sir, are you okay? And they're like, huh? and they look at me, they're drowsy. They're not alert, but they're responsive to my voice. That's okay. 
If they're responsive to the pain, Mr. Mr. Are you okay? No response. I take my hand and I rub your sternum. I do a sternal rub. Oh, if they do some kind of decerebrate or decorticate or if they push your hand away, that's better than being brain dead. The last part is unresponsive. Mr. Mr. Are you okay? I do a sternal rub. I try to start an IV. I put a Foley catheter. You have no movement. That is a poor sign that you have, you know, neurological um, problems going on. So a priority action for anybody who is unresponsive is what? It doesn't change, y'all go back to airway, breathing, and circulation. If you're unresponsive, you no longer have the ability to control your airway. And it's also likely that you're gonna be a, a more um, cardiopulmonary system failure, heart attack, or at least you're not breathing. If you're not breathing, you're gonna have a heart attack soon enough, or you're gonna have a myocardial infarction. So we know that unresponsive people Get vital signs. That's one of your first acts. Mr. Mr. You okay? No response. Hey, you call, call for help, get the crash cart, whatever. I'm going to do vital signs because they're going to tell me airway, breathing, circulation. The last part is exposure. This is what I was saying. Everybody who comes in gets trauma naked. We do. I will cut your clothes off. I don't care what you're wearing because if I can't look at your body, I don't know where your wounds are. If you have a penetrating wound, if you have a gunshot, do I have one wound or do I have two wounds? We don't say exit wounds and entrance wounds. We say one wound, two wounds. That's it. I don't know where it went in or came out. Not for me to decide. There's two wounds or there's one wound. I can't know that unless I take your clothes off. I don't know if you got burnt. I don't know if you have compartment syndrome. I don't know anything until we do that. So we don't have to have permission to cut your clothes off. We remove all clothing and we do this so we can look at your assessment. But we have to be cognizant of a couple things. Patients who are unresponsive, we have something called implied consent, right? Implied consent says anybody in that situation, we're going to assume if they get brought to an emergency room, they would want you to do everything they can to save your life. Unless you have something that says otherwise, we are going to move forward with that assumption. So we have something called implied consent. So verbal permission, not required. We're going to cut them off regardless. However, when we do that, if you've ever been to a trauma center, we keep trauma rooms nice and hot for a reason. Because when we get you trauma naked, we have to think about hypothermia and we have to think about keeping your body temperature well above what's required to prevent you from going into like metabolic acidosis and stuff like that. I, I really think about this because I, I'm, a trauma, I'm a trauma nurse. I've also worked at the level one trauma center here at BAMC, which is the military hospital in, in San Antonio. And they have a burn center. Y'all just had burns last week or last test. We know when people have burns, they are subjected to hypothermia. So anybody coming in with trauma, burns, fire, car wrecks, we have to think about hypothermia. You've already looked at that in chapter 11. I'm not going to go over it again, but I want you to know that patients who have hypothermia, their circulatory insufficiency occurs and they can end up in metabolic acidosis. And I put the, go back and look if you want to, but when you, when, you, when you have a reduced metabolism, the need for oxygen does not stimulate the respiratory center any longer. This, can, this condition depresses your ventilatory rate. It causes CO2 levels to go up. It can also cause respiratory acidosis. So there's a lot of things. We know patients who have hypothermia often go into acidosis. So that is a acid-based imbalance that these people suffer all the time. So just be aware of that. That's it for this chapter. So we're going to move on. We're done with chapter um, 10. We're going to go right into chapter 11. And I'm going to show you what your, your syllabus says for chapter 11. It says we're going to go over heat-related injuries, lightning injuries, cold-related injuries, and altitude sickness and some drowning. And it ain't much. So let's pop right over there. All right. Same thing on this one. Tissue integrity and pain. Um, this one's not, it's not going over safety at this point, but safety is still part of this. It is not so much for you and I, but the patients. But we're talking about tissue integrity. We're talking about pain. And tissue integrity doesn't mean your fingers, all tissue. It could be your kidneys. It could be your liver. It could be your brain. It could be your heart muscle. That's still tissue, y'all. So tissue integrity is something I think of a, a, a little bigger, if you will. So let's kind of move down here. Heat-related illnesses, typically we have to focus on removing the patient from the heat source and cooling them down before they end up having brain damage. That's really what we're looking at, looking at. So if I think about heat-related illnesses, there are some things that perpetuate you and increase your risk. Um, obesity, heart disease, infections. If you work out 
in the hot of the day, if you have seizures, mental health disorders, any kind of burns, they increase your risk for um, heat related injuries. There are some other things you can look at as far as medications. I don't know that I've ever seen these on any kind of exam, but hey, who knows anymore? Just look at them and have them there. Um, things we can, we can think about as far as heat related illnesses, you already know, don't drink or use caffeine. Caffeine can cause some, some baso, uh, um, uh, effective, you know, think about when we think about the dilation and constriction, how caffeine does that. Alcohol can cause you to be careless if you're not, you, you know this, I'm not going over all this stuff. You already understand what you should and shouldn't do. So let's move on to the, the two diseases that we really talk about when we talk about heat related injuries. We have heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Heat exhaustion means you got too hot, but your body is still able to compensate. You're able to sweat. You're able to have convection heat loss, conduction heat loss. Your body has a mechanism to, to try to counteract the heat. Typically dehydration, you're out there working too much, you, you perspire too heavily, and you don't replace the liquids and the electrolytes like you should over hours or days. So that leads to this, this dehydration, hyponatremia, things of that nature. It will cause you to die at some point if you don't do something about it, but we have time on this. So as I'm thinking about patients who are in heat exhaustion, I think about fluid volume deficit. So safety comes to mind always. And I think about hypotension, especially orthostatic hypotension. And when the patient stands up, especially if they're older and they're dehydrated, they can fall, hit their head, break their hip, have a stroke and die. Patient safety never stops. <clears throat> if you have a patient come in who's hot, or you're out there on the on on on, on the ER, um, in, in sorry, in the um, ambulance, your pre-hospital, whatever that looks like. If they're hot, remove them from the heat source. Do something to physically cool them down. Move them to a cool place. Use any kind of cooling measure you can think of. As a kid, I had a real bad fever one time. My family, I remember, she called the neighbor. My mom called the neighbor over, and they they took off most of my clothes, and they got cold towels, and they laid them on my chest and my abdomen. And I remember them shoving ice packs in my armpits and in my groin. And I just remember as a young kid, them saying, oh, if we, you lose heat from these areas. So don't be afraid of that. Putting, putting um, cooling measures in place, like cold packs. Cold packs actually work, especially in places that are very, what, vascular, chest, abdomen, groin, axillary, your, your, your neck. Do those kind of things. Um, they are going to help cool your patient down. Get them wet. Have moisture, have some, have some spraying of water, take off the clothes that are too tight, things like that. Never give salt tablets. If you do, you can cause stomach irritation, which perpetuates the problem. Now they're vomiting. Now they're nauseous. They're losing more fluids. So we don't want to do that. We have to be very cognizant of what we're trying to do. All right. When you get to heat stroke, this is now an medical emergency, so much so that even my Marines... If we're out there in wherever and my Marines get a heat stroke, they can be separated from the military because once you have a heat stroke, it makes you more likely to have another one. It messes with the things in your body, your thermoregulation. So when you have a temperature of 104, your thermoregulation mechanisms fail and they can't adjust. And this is truly a medical emergency because these people can die if you don't do something immediately. So sometimes there, there's no they will have long-term effects. They might have organ dysfunction. I just want you to understand the difference. When you see somebody who has a heat stroke, typically they have an elevated temperature of above 104 and their skin is usually hot and dry. It doesn't always have to be hot and dry. The presence of sweating does not mean you're ha not having a heat stroke, but people with heat strokes don't typically perspire as much. They're usually dry and they're hot and they're no longer able to produce enough sweat to cool the body down. So when we think about that, mental changes is the biggest one. Mental changes is huge in a patient who has heat uh, stroke because we're worried about them not getting oxygen to their brain because they're not perfusing correctly because they're severely dehydrated. Cardiac troponins elevated, once again, because they're not perfusing. It all makes sense when you think about it. So go back and understand what it looks like when a patient has heat stroke, hot and dry, temps over 104. They're gonna have signs and symptoms of true hypovolemic shock, 
hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea. They always go together when you think about shock, other than like neurogenic shock. All right. Um, other things you can think about, I'm going to say it again, place ice in their cloth, in their clothing and bags. Put it places where you have a lot of vasculature areas, the scalp, the groin, behind the neck, the armpits. I've seen it over and over again because I see it on every ATI I've ever seen. It's going to pop up again. All right. Make sure you're actively cooling your patient down because they no longer have the mechanism to do so in their body. I'm going to keep scrolling down and get through some other stuff. We're not talking about spiders or snakes or scorpions or anything like that. But we are going to talk about lightning injuries because your book said so. And if you look in your syllabus, that's what it says right there. We're going to talk about lightning injuries. So what's a lightning injury? It's two things. It's electrocution and it's also a burn. So with these patients, most of them die due to cardiopulmonary system problems. They, they die of cardiac arrest. If you know anything about cardiac muscle, Cardiac cells are autorhythmic, meaning they, they can spontaneously generate their own rhythm. And when we electrocute somebody, and that's exactly what energy from you know, the earth is when you get struck by lightning, these patients are more likely to end up in cardiac arrest. So that's typically what we look at with a patient who has undergone some kind of lightning injury. We have to think about EKGs. We have to think about things of that nature. That's what I want you to be paying attention to. There's a whole slew of things you need to teach your patients. I don't know where they pop up. These are all common sense things to me. So if you don't understand it, then go back and look at it. If you're in the water, get out. You know, if, if you're outside somewhere in the open, don't be. Like, you, you get this. So if you need to go back and look at them, please do. But in the ER, think about ECGs. Think about myocardial perfusion. Look for dysrhythmias. Look for angina. Look for chest pain. Anything that would lead you to believe your patient is not having good perfusion. Another thing I want you to understand is patients may have full thickness burns, charring, contact burns from overlying metal objects. These are just things that we have to worry about. So like any other burn out there, and I put it down here as well, all burn victims, including electrical burn victims, you have to be aware of things like suet in their nose, singed eyebrows, singed mustaches. They have hoarseness. Um, they have wheezing. Y'all, those are signs and symptoms that your patient very much might have a burn that has compromised their airway. Nobody in nursing cares about anything more than airway breathing and circulation. The doctor is going to save them on a different level, y'all. So our main job is always going to be assessing and determining what we can do to, to lessen their problem and make their situation better. When you start thinking that way, it's not near as crazy. So think about what it looks like. Think about your patient and what you have to be concerned about with a patient who gets burned, especially electrical burns. Um, you, you might need to go back and get, you can get a, 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 a CK, which tells you if you have any kind of muscle damage. Um, rhabdomyolysis. People who have electrical burns, they will. They'll get, that, they'll get the, the, the muscle breakdown. So when you think about rhabdo, it, it sends out, it, it's, it's release, it sends out byproducts and it can cause kidney failure. So when we have patients who are electrical burn patients, we think about burn wounds. We think about these people who might not have airways, but I also need you to think about people who might have rhabdo and they might actually have kidney failure. So look for signs and symptoms of kidney uh, damage, lack of fluid output, less than 30 an hour. You know how this goes. All right, hypothermia is the first of the cold injuries we talk about. I don't get too involved with hypothermia because I've already talked about it with you already. And I just want you to know your temperature is less than 95 point, you know, 95. So nothing really to write home about. Um, what I like to talk about is when you get hypothermic, it's not always a bad thing. Hypothermia slows down your body's metabolism. And when we talk about metabolism, we're saying we're slowing down all of your body functions, the need for oxygen to your brain, to your heart, to your kidneys. So we actually use hypothermia in the hospital when we have patients who have heart attacks or strokes. We know fair well that if we do a medically induced hypothermia, we can reduce a lot of tissue damage. So I want you to keep that in mind because when I think about somebody who comes in hypothermic, there's something I put down here a long time ago. This is a longstanding principle in the patient um, being treated with hypothermia, especially if they have cardiac arrest, is no one is dead until they're warm and dead. If your body temperature is not 98.6, we will never pronounce you dead. I mean, unless you don't have a head or your brain matters out or you have a viscerated, you know, things like that. But just because you drowned 
or you fell into some water or you got severely cold out somewhere and now your body temperature is nice and low. There's documented case after documented case that shows people who were clinically dead returned to spontaneous respirations and spontaneous life once they were warmed back up. They weren't dead. Their body was just in a state of, uh, of severe, severe metabolic, uh, you know, saving. It was just saving itself. It slowed down its body systems where the heart rate didn't even have to beat in order to have, it was so slow, it didn't require any oxygen. So that's what I want you to think about hypothermia. There's a lot going on with it. You understand what you need to do. I've talked about the things I want to talk about. If they're, if they're wet, take their clothes off. As long as they're in an area, they're not going to get cold again. Passive uh, rewarming. It's okay to put blankets on them. If you're out somewhere, you could use your body heat. You could do things like that. You don't want to raise their temperature too high, but you want to think about, you know, bringing it up moderately. Um, hypothermic people are at risk for cardiac arrest. Kind of talked about that as well. I just want you to understand what I just talked about, though. Uh, make sure that you understand you have to warm them up and you have to be aware of things like um, acidosis arising because of the severe drop in temperature and the shaking and, you know, the muscle usage. Frostbite, we treat like any other burn. Um, if there's a chance that the frostbite will be refrozen after you thaw it out, you would never dethaw it, right? The main risk factors um, for, for getting frostbite is being exposed to the cold too long without the proper um, protective equipment. Wet clothing can, can cause that. Um, fatigue, dehydration, being poor nutritional status, having vascular problems already. You know, if you have peripheral artery disease, if you have, you know, burgers or, 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 or you know, things like that, that might also put you at risk for something like this. So just be aware of the type of patients who, who might be at risk for um, frostbite. But more importantly, what are you worried about? We're talking about tissue integrity. When the, when the tissue freezes, it becomes damaged and it will die off. It is a burn like anything else. So your book says, look for that white waxy appearance to expose skin, especially on you know, the exposed areas. Um, those are the ones who are gonna be worse before they get better. Um, if a person has darker skin, skin becomes wax and paley and somewhat gray. So just be aware of what that looks like. Here's what I want you to pay attention to. Apply only loose non-adherent sterile dressings to any of the damaged area. When you see these uh, blisters, treat it like a burn. You're not gonna pop them. You're going to put sterile dressing over them to prevent them from getting infected. That's what we're going to do. That's what your book says we need to do. So that's what we're going to do. All right. Your book also mentions high altitude illness, which I don't really understand why, but I know the one thing I know about high altitude sickness or illness. When you're somewhere high enough, um, your, body get, your body gets low pressure of oxygen. So you're not perfusing your body. When I went to Pikes Peak and... Um, Colorado Springs, and I try to do some running on that freaking hill. It was 14,000 feet in the air. I thought I was going to die. I really did. I could not catch my breath. I got altitude sickness, and I thought, oh, wow, this is real. Like, I can run. I ran 10 miles in Denver. That was no problem. The Mile High City didn't get me, but boy, you go to Pikes Peak and you get really high above that 5,000 meters. I was sick, y'all. So, health promotion. There are some medications, medications, medications. Um, this medication right here, I want you to pronounce it for yourself. Cetazolamide, right? What is this? It is a medication that we're going to treat for people who have these, these altitude motion sickness type things. So this medication is, that's the only reason I know about it is because everybody, when they did like the half marathons and stuff over there at Pikes Peak, y'all people were just sick and that was the medication they gave out so that's what i know about altitude sickness other than that you know whatever your teacher told you i'd go with um drowning i think the big thing about drowning is making sure you know how to prevent this make sure you talk about the prevention is key and talk to parents who have children because that's a lot of what's going on other people who drown often is people who use alcohol and go out there you know how people are hold my beer watch this there you go what I want you to really pay attention to is if somebody is in cold water and we remove them, we have to warm them up before we can expect them to come back to, to life again. So they might not come right away. We're still going to start CPR. But if you start doing CPR with somebody who drowned, what do we know about somebody who drowned? 
They got fluid in their lungs and their alveolar spaces are filled with fluid so we don't get good gas exchange. So recognize that you must not attempt to get the water out of the patient's lungs, respond by delivering abdominal thrust only if the patient's obstructed and, and you can't get any kind of good gas exchange. That's all we can do, abdominal thrust. We're trying to get them to cough up on their own. It's scary, but that's all you can do. There's not a lot you're gonna be able to do to clear that. All right, that is it for that chapter. We're gonna to go to the very last chapter and your book said that's gonna be chapter 12. And we're gonna go down to disaster preparedness, pages 223 through 236. Oops. So we're going to go over here and open up the last chapter here, which is 12. And as you can already see, I already have this down here, 223. It starts on page one. If you don't know anything about disasters, it's always the same stuff, y'all. We're worried about safety, communication, and our team, because that's what we're caring about. When I say types of disaster, they have man-made disasters. They have natural disasters. Man-made disasters are all the tornadoes we see. If you live anywhere in the Midwest, you know tornadoes. I'm from Arkansas. Trust me, if you're in Tennessee, I know you know. If you're down here in San Antonio, we have flash flooding. That is one of our things. If you're in Houston, they have real flooding. Um, we also have hurricanes. If you're in you know, Florida, anywhere like that, anywhere that Galen has a campus, we have all kinds of stuff going on. So those are some very much uh, um, uh, natural disasters that, we, we still plan for these. There's also man-made disasters, like shooting schools, like shooting up in Las Vegas, like um, plane wrecks, like train wrecks. All of these things happen. A, 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 a mass, uh, um, a, a disaster, a mass casualty just means we have more people than we can care for. So it depends on the level uh, uh, of your hospital. Think about the pandemic. That was a natural disaster, right? We had no say-so on that. It just came. There was nothing we could do about it. So when we start thinking about disasters, I want you to think safety. So, but I want you to focus on a few things that I know always pop up on NCLEX. And we're gonna talk about external disasters. 9-11 was a huge one. I mean, we think 2001, and that was, that was 20, 21 years ago this year that that occurred. And that was tragic and people died. There's a lot, but we, we kill more people. We kill 100,000 people a year in the hospital. We do as a profession, not nurses, but just in general. So there's a lot going on. I just want you to be aware of all the things that we have to pay attention to. These external disasters do occur. Um, if you remember a few years back, things like anthrax. Remember anthrax was one of those things that they were mailing uh, domestic terrorism. They were mailing this white powder to people like in Congress and other people. And we're worried about these because they, they, they can be inhaled. My point is this. When I think about safety on any disaster, think about the safety of everybody. Think about the, the, the other patients in the hospital. Think about your staff and your coworkers and everybody else who's going to come in there, the family members. Immediately, if you have any patient who comes in who has any kind of exposure to anything sea burning, chemical, biological, radioactive, or, or, or nuclear, you have to let hospital administration know right away because we have to prevent additional patients from getting injury. Same thing with anthrax. It doesn't matter. I, we say NBC, uh, neurological, uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical. I, I'm the old school and it was C, it was C Um, That was a military thing. So we had radiation sickness and things of that nature as well. But just be aware, that's what you're looking for. It is a public health risk. And as soon as you're notified, you have to let somebody else notify so they can call the disaster preparedness team so they can get some of these professionals out there. We need hazmat. We're not trained in hazmat all the time, but be aware of this. Um, there's just a lot going on. I couldn't possibly tell you everything about this, but I'm covering the things I always hear and we talk about quite frequently. If somebody comes in, we quarantine them right away. We do everything safety-wise. So if you're looking for any kind of, any kind of test questions or answers, and you're trying to figure out what the right choice is, keep thinking about patient safety, containment, not spreading diseases to anybody else, preventing injury from anybody anywhere. That's what I need you to really pay attention to. All right, emergency preparedness and response. Y'all, every hospital system in America, we have a federal emergency management agency, so FEMA, right? Part of what we also do 
as a hospital system, we call in every morning to our state. When I was in Tennessee as a house supervisor there in Memphis, I would call every morning. I had, a, I had a call this number or go to this website and put in how many beds we had available, how many ORs we had, how many ER beds. That way, if there was a natural disaster in that area or any other kind of terroristic attack, we would know exactly where you could send people. So that's what emergency preparedness is. It's just something we're looking at. All right, so when we think about mass casualty, we're thinking about people and we have a number of people that overwhelm our um, healthcare system. So a key process in any kind of multi-casualty or mass casualty response is effective triage. And triage changes when you think about triage in an ER versus triage in a mass casualty. So what you're trying to do is save anybody you can save initially apply tourniquets, whatever. I'm not going to get into that right away, but I want you to understand it is different. So if you think about triage under normal conditions, emergent people, immediate threat to life. They are emergent. We're going to do stuff. So yeah, they're still emergent. They're a red tag, meaning they need to be seen right away, immediate threat to life. But we also have to think about resources, right? Because resources matter as well. Urgent, still urgent, major issues, it's a yellow. Non-urgent, still the same thing. We call that green. You're good to go. There's some caution. You got to stop right now. But we also have something called expectant or a class four, which means you get a black tag saying you're probably going to die or we're going to allow you to die. That means some people with emergent issues in the ER, if you come in on a regular day, I can take all of the blood in our blood bank and give to an 80-year-old patient who may or may not live. If you come in during a mass casualty and grandma got hurt and she's 86 and she doesn't have a good outcome, it doesn't look like she might live, we're probably not going to do anything with her. We're going to put her over there with the expected and say, you lived a good life, but we have to manage our resources. That's hard for a lot of people, y'all, but I want you to understand what that looks like. You have to be aware of the differences because you never know what you're going to get up on one of your exams. Just be aware that we do have an expectant. If, you, if it looks like you're going to die, we're probably going to let you if it's under mass casualty. I know that sounds horrible, but that's just the way life works sometimes. All right. Um, there's a lot here. I'm keeping going down. Um, you can look at the personal roles. You can go back and see what you're supposed to do. But I want to get down here to something. And so the efforts are made quickly to discharge or admit other ED patients as appropriate to make room for new arrivals. What we mean by this is when you have to think about hospital preparedness and you have to think about triage and you have to think about who we're going to see first, we're talking about life and death decisions. We are going to kick certain people out of the hospital who probably should stay, but we ain't got room for you, so you got to go. We're not going to kick out anybody who's going to die. If you just had open heart surgery yesterday, there's no way we could possibly send you home. So every effort has to be made to figure out who we can get discharged. I'll put some examples over here. If you know you're going to go home tomorrow anyway, it's probably okay to send you home today and have you come back and get your treatment tomorrow. We need that room for somebody else. So I think about people who have uh, uh, cancer patients uh, who have cancer treatment. I'm not saying cancer treatment is not important, but it depends. If you have stage four cancer and we're just trying to do some stuff to help you have a longer life, we're probably going to have to send you home that day. You can come back tomorrow. It's an inconvenience, but let's just be honest. We're trying to save the, 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 the most amount of people possible. I don't know if you're going to be discharged tomorrow and you had your last IV antibiotic today and you're going to be stick put on oral by antibiotics tomorrow. You can most definitely go home today. We'll just have to get you a ride home. So be aware that the way the ER and things work is a little bit different on um, the way you have to think about patients, the way you have to think about what your role is. It's all about patient safety and it's all about making a decision that benefits the good of everybody. All right, that's all I have to talk about. So I'm going to end on that. If you have any questions, please let me know.